he first uses the German system with the Mauser K98 rifle. We undo the locking screw. The scope is well engineered, but requires a tool to adjust between shots. On the line, nine o'clock. Nine rings to chimney, the line. Click the X. One more click. Okay, you're there. Five rounds, and that rifle is now zeroed. Pegler tests the scope on a Soviet Mazen Nagant rifle and notices a big difference right away. Seven ring, six o'clock. The adjustment on these Soviet scopes is an awful lot simpler than on the Mauser. There's no tools involved. I can just do it with my fingers. It makes life a lot easier for the sniper. Nine ring, four o'clock. Center. X. It takes only three shots before the Soviet rifle is zeroed. As the Moisin zeroed, it was very easy. Just use the adjuster drums, it took me three shots, and it's spot on. If for any reason I lose the zero, if I need to return the zero again, it's a very straightforward process. If my life was going to depend on sniping, I think I would probably opt for the Moisin. The Soviet scope gave Red Army marksmen an advantage. But it doesn't alone explain why Russian snipers were so dominant in Stalingrad. The Russian sniper had a very profound effect at Stalingrad. The Germans loathed and feared the Soviet snipers. They couldn't get away from it. It didn't matter where they were. A careless movement, just showing your head a little bit too much above a trench, would bring a sniper's bullet. Many Russian snipers like the celebrated Vasily Zaitsev, were recruited from remote areas such as Siberia, where marksmanship was vital for hunting. But it seems it was more than just hunters that were involved with shooting in the pre-war years in Russia. In the 1930s, millions and millions of, uh, of young Russians, men and women, had uh, gone out to get their sharpshooter badge, which meant you qualified, really, as, as an effective sniper. And when the war came, the Soviet Union had a culture, really, among its young people um, of shooting with great accuracy. It was a culture that would prove immensely valuable to the Red Army. This cult of, of sniperism grew up mainly through the media. They made their snipers into heroes. Um, they were people who were lauded publicly, given honours and awards, whereas in every other country, the sniper was regarded as rather the dirty dog of war. With large numbers of experienced sharpshooters using high-quality, simple-to-use scopes, the Red Army inflicted heavy physical and psychological casualties on the Germans. By late November 1942, the German assault on Stalingrad had reached a bloody stalemate. The situation was about to become even worse as both sides prepared for the onset of a mutual foe, the Russian winter. The German blitzkrieg attacks on Stalingrad had failed. Now they were engaged in bitter guerrilla warfare with Red Army fighters. In November 1942, the situation worsened with the first snows of winter. Temperatures plummeted to as low as minus 40 degrees. For the Germans, who had expected to take Stalingrad by September, of course, um, the onset of winter was always going to be a problem. The savage winter, known to the Red Army as General Frost, is seen by many historians to have been a major factor in the German failure at Stalingrad. The cold affected both sides equally, and so can't in itself be a reason why the Germans were defeated. But military equipment was vulnerable to the sub-zero temperatures. Mechanical systems were liable to freeze if they were not properly maintained. 
including radios, vehicle engines, and weapons. It was often so cold that even gun oil froze, rendering weapons useless. Sniping expert Martin Pegler has heard that the Russians had a simple method that helped them keep their weapons working through the winter. He's found that to keep oil fluid, the Russians added gasoline. Pegler sets up an experiment to test the Russian method. He's using two original Russian Mazen Nagant rifles from World War II. One using the Russian oil and gasoline mix, the other using plain oil as used by the Germans. A climate chamber is used to simulate the Russian temperatures. After being stored for just two hours, the equivalent to a soldier's period of sentry duty, Pegler finds a noticeable difference between the two mixes of oil. Whilst the German oil has solidified to the point where it's like wax, completely immovable, the Soviet oil is still liquid. But the real test will be how the rifles have been affected. First, he tries the one with the Russian gasoline and oil mix. Well, it works. German rifle, see how this one functions. But it does work, but it's very stiff. It is functioning, but it's an awful lot stiffer than the Russian rifle, so I think we can take it that the oil hasn't worked as effectively as the Russian rifle has done. Pegler's research backs up German accounts which tell of soldiers having to throw away weapons after they jammed because of the cold. As the Russians held out into the depths of winter, both sides were engaged in virtual Arctic warfare. It seems there were other differences in the ways in which both sides prepared their troops for the cold. Tony Barton is a specialist on historical clothing. He spent years studying the uniforms worn by both the Germans and the Russians in World War II. The German uniform is really a culmination of the 19th century uniform tradition. He's wearing a shirt, possibly with a vest underneath it. He's got a woolen tunic. He's got a woolen greatcoat on top of that. One of the problems they had was in the winter, wearing a helmet is not a very good idea because the steel shell cools off incredibly quickly, which means your head's extremely cold. And there were problems with this, with soldiers developing frostbite in severe conditions. Barton has found that the Russians had a very different approach. What this soldier is wearing, fairly heavy underwear, normally cotton in, in the winter. He's got a woolen tunic on, on top of that. And both of these are loose fitting. Over the tunic, he's wearing a padded telegreka, which is a typical Central Asian garment made of quilted layers of padded cotton. It's the sort of thing worn by a nomad horseman on the steppe. They're extremely intelligent use of uh, materials because they're very cheap, they're relatively easy to make, and they give fantastically good insulating properties. Instead of steel helmets, many Russian soldiers were issued with a fur cap called a nushanka. Everybody says it's a real fur hat. It isn't a real fur hat. It's actually a fake fur hat. The average Russian soldier referred to it as fish fur since it came from no animal that they'd actually ever seen, so it must have come from a fish. Six decades after the Battle of Stalingrad, can Tony Barton uncover the secret of why the Russians did so much better in the cold? It's another task for the climate chamber. Thermocouples, devices for measuring temperature, will enable Barton to compare how the garments resist the cold. The mannequins begin the test at normal room temperature, 72 degrees, or 21 to 23 degrees Celsius. Inside the chamber, it's minus 40. Almost immediately, the two uniforms begin to react differently. It is actually beginning to show a difference now. The Russian is retaining his heat a little bit better. 
of course the uniforms are made of different materials which will have different thermal capacities so there'll be differential rates of cooling. The chamber also circulates the air to simulate wind chill. This cools the mannequins much faster than still air. Very soon, there's a difference of several degrees. 